I spent my childhood in India. India is often described as a country of diversity. By the way, this is me. <laughs> India has many ethnic groups and religions, which means there are a variety of languages, clothes, foods, and more. Just to show an example, my family driver was a Hindu, and my house guard was a Muslim, and our housekeeper was a Christian. Showing some other examples, Indian banknotes were written in 17 different languages, and last but not least, Indian often could not communicate with each other, even in their native languages, and ending up talking in English. Although I live in an urban area of India, I saw people in the cities never abandon their native culture. They seem to preserve their dresses, habits, and rituals that were typical of their community while adapting an urban culture. Growing up in such a place, culture is something very close to me, something vital. When I returned to Japan and came back to Tokyo as a junior high school student, I was so shocked because nobody was wearing kimono. See, in India, it was really easy to find someone wearing traditional clothes, so I had always imagined this kind of scenery as Tokyo. <laughs> Joking apart, I was surprised by the lack of culture in Tokyo. Lack of culture, I say, doesn't mean that there's no culture in Tokyo. What I want to mean is as a city whose population is made up of people from all over Japan, I didn't feel much diversity. So according to the National Institute of Population and Social Security Research in 2016, 45% of Tokyo's residents coming from regions outside Tokyo. And I knew that Japan consists of various cultures and traditions if so, why can't we share our own culture? Furthermore, the most disappointing fact was there were almost nobody who was willing to live outside Tokyo. According to the Tokyo Metropolitan Government research in 2020, over 90% of Tokyo residents are saying that they are willing to live in Tokyo as long as they can. In fact, when I introduced my life in countryside to my friends in Tokyo, most of them are not showing much interest, saying because it is inconvenient. So they often ask me these questions. How many convenience stores are there in your town? Does your town have those popular stores? <laughs> if it doesn't, then you're living in non-attractive countryside. Hmm. But isn't it strange to characterize towns only with so-called convenience? To live is to be in a town. I think it's pity if our identity is based just on convenience. In urban life, it is very rare to have contact with your neighbors. Imagine we are all living in the same architecture and doesn't even know each other's name. It's pretty weird, I think. What about when you go out to buy food? In few minutes walk supermarket, foods are neatly packaged in plastic and lined up, and prices are all fixed, and self-checkout is available to avoid having any interactions with people at all. And that is what they call convenient. For me, Tokyo is such a weird city in the sense that it has a huge population without diversity and interaction. Still, most of the towns are simply dismissed being as inconvenient. If this situation continues, Japan will become a monotonous Tokyo and the country will lose its culture completely. Living in Tokyo for six years, I felt fear about my own country's future. So I, after I graduated from high school, I went to Tohoku University, located in Sendai City, Tohoku region. I was learning mechanical and aerospace engineering in the university. My campus stands in the middle of the forest and has a great nature. 
let me share my second grade year one day schedule to promote a bit about the hoku. So I woke up at six on this day, and first I take a car. In just a 30 minutes car ride from the campus, we have a great hot spring. And there are some grandpas in the morning being in the 45 degree Celsius bath for more than one hour saying, hey young guy, can't you stay in the bath anymore? If you surrender, I'm going to the winner. I was like, most of your nerves have already died. That's why you can be in the past such, for such a long time, right? <laughs> we enjoy the talk, anyway. After I took a bath, I often talked with grandmas there. They are talking about how their vegetables are growing, how the neighbors are doing, and how many teeth still remain on their mouths. <laughs> and then I had sort of some dynamics class from 10.30. <laughs> This is the hoku and this is my life. So back to the main topic. There are six prefectures in Tohoku and one of which is Fukushima. Since it is the same region, I had the opportunity to visit the town in Fukushima named Futaba. Futaba was devastated by the tsunami and nuclear disaster caused by the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake, as you may know. In 2021, the time when I visited, the difficult to return to area had not yet been lifted and the whole town was uninhabitable. The town has zero residents with zero industry. I witnessed the ultimate situation. But when we think about the disaster, we tend to think Futaba happened to lose its population cause of the disaster. However, what I thought at that time is, if people keep moving to Tokyo, like now, even without the natural disaster, rural areas all over Japan would become like the landscape I was witnessing then. So what does this number show? It shows the number of towns in Japan which may disappear by 2040. 896 means 49.8% of Japanese towns. This was stated in the Masuda report published in 2014 by Japan Policy Council. So are towns really going to disappear in Japan? Let me share some other data. So this is a graph showing the number of in-migration by prefecture in 2021. The vertical axis shows the number of people moving in and out. We can see that population is drastically increasing in Greater Tokyo area and prefectures which has big cities like uh, Osaka and Fukuoka. However, it is decreasing across the board in other prefectures. This shows that thousands of people are floating into cities from the rural areas every year. It is clear that towns will disappear. Still people say, urban areas are so convenient that there is no reason for young people to stay in rural areas. Okay, then now let us think about the urban life convenience. Where do these electricities coming from? All the nuclear power electricity that comes to Tokyo derives from North Japan, not from Tokyo. Actually, the nuclear power plant in Futaba, which caused the accident, was also built to send electricity to Tokyo, not for the local people. What about our food? According to a 2019 Ministry of Agriculture's Forestry and Fisheries Survey, the food self-sufficiency rate in Tokyo is 0.49% and one person in Osaka. It means if this is your evening meal and you declare independence from others, Tokyo can provide just this part. <laughs> the fish eyes are quite delicious, but not sufficient to survive. Moreover, on average, the greater Tokyo area, including Saitama, Chiba, and Kanagawa, has a food self-sufficiency rate of 9%, while Tohoku region has 
So there are the people working in the other regions who support the convenient life in urban areas. That means if the number of rural areas which are indispensable for cities continues to decrease, the country itself will disappear. I couldn't stop myself thinking about it. I felt duty and also the motivation to tackle on the problem. I wanted to share the beauty of rural areas and create a flow of people from cities to rural areas. With this in my mind, I started my project from Hutaba. So in Hutaba town, where people have dis disappeared once, the first thing you need to do is of course gather people and make a community. So I did a tour of the town with my two friends. It may sound surprising, but when we promoted the tour, we did not use the earthquake or the accident as a content at all. Let's do yoga. That was the only word that brought people together. This was because Hutawa had huge glass fields and geographically mostly sunny. And last but not least, two of my friends are from India, a big yoga country. So in a town that has been built from scratch, there is no point in gathering people out of sympathy. That was our belief. By focusing on creating community on the tour, we hoped the participants would create good memories and come back to the region again. The result was hopeful. A total of about 100 people took part in the tours over those two years. And what makes us happy is that 30% of the tour participants came back to the region after the tour. This is very unusual data in the region. And all the people who came back to the town had special skills. A nutritionist who is a food professional, a student who won numerous hours in journalism, engineers, designers, linguists, and more. And also we realized that Hutaba has abundant cultures and histories which can be branded. It is not just a disaster affected town. So I tried to make something that made use of the town's resources and their special skills. As a result, we made cookies in the shape of Hutaba's Hutaba Dharma dolls, which are now beloved in the town. We could also develop magazines about the town, spreading its charms to the world. And all of these projects gradually yielded results with the support of many, many people. What I have realized through our activities in Hutaba is that we as individuals can get involved in rural areas and cause changes. And when we do so, we can create irresponsible, irresponsible bonds with the people with whom we share our actions with. This is what I value open convenience. In March this year, my colleagues and I launched a company. We are focusing on regional branding to attract people to the rural areas. The Valingan media we have developed in both Japanese and English already have a readership of more than 10,000 people, and the magazines are distributed in 36 locations throughout Japan, and two, actually, in India. <laughs> I was very happy that we could reach India where my love for culture was born. So as we expand our activities to the world, we have realized that the problem of depopulation in rural areas is by no means unique to them. Across the world, this problem is becoming more serious day by day. So where is your hometown? Where does your food come from? How are your clothes woven? When we think about these questions, we realize that we are surrounded by tanks related to so many places with countless histories and cultures. I don't want to lose them. I don't want to leave our next generations without passing on the beautiful cultures which our ancestors made. What about you? 
At an age where we have access to unlimited information, where we can travel almost anywhere, there are infinite possibilities for you to have a relationship with rural areas. So let me let ask you one last question. How will you associate with your town? Thank you.